Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. Did you see the cover of the New York Post yesterday? If you didn't, you need to. Toddler and Tiara in reference to Meghan Markle. We're going to speak with the author of that barn burner of an article later this show. While Nelson Mandela's family is responding to Markle's comments this week. Also, a little fact check by yours truly on her latest round of lies. But we begin today with an exclusive interview with someone whose work you definitely know. Richie McGinnis was a video producer for The Daily Caller, and his job brought him to the front lines of some of the most impactful moments in recent American history. The stories that others would ignore, the reporters who wanted to stand on the outskirts of, say, the BLM protests and tell you that they were mostly peaceful. Richie was in the middle of them and is one of the reasons we know they were not that they were not mostly peaceful, that they were violent, that people died, people got hurt, and so on. This is a guy who, as the very best journalists will do, runs toward the danger so that you can know what's actually going on. And as a result, he he's found himself, especially these past couple of years, in the midst of some of the biggest news stories in the country. Um, the riots that we saw, I mentioned, from the summer of 2020, he was also there right in the mix on January 6th, and he was smeared by the New York Times. We'll get to that. But it was one night in Kenosha, Wisconsin, that turned Richie McGinnis from a journalistic observer to part of the story as he became involved in the Kyle Rittenhouse saga and then a witness in the trial that captured the attention of the nation. Are you tired of feeling like someone's always watching you on the Internet? Maybe advertisers know a little bit too much about you or you're concerned about the privacy of your identity. Using incognito mode will not solve the problem either. IPVanish VPN is here to protect your right to privacy and help you stay anonymous online. IPVanish helps you safely browse the internet without exposing your private details to third parties like hackers or your ISP or advertisers. When you use IPVanish, all of your data is encrypted. This means your private details, passwords, communications, browsing history, and more will be completely shielded from falling into the wrong hands. Even your physical location will be hidden. IP Vanish is offering an incredible 70% off their yearly plan for our listeners with a 30-day money-back guarantee. That's like getting nine months for free. IP Vanish is super easy to use as well. All you have to do is tap one button. You're instantly protected. Take your privacy back today with a brand rated 4.6 out of 5 on Trustpilot. Go to ipvanish.com slash Megan and use the promo code M-E-G-Y-N to claim your 70% savings. That's I-P-V-A-N-I-S-H dot com slash Megan. For the first time since taking the witness stand, Richie McGinnis is now speaking out. This is his first on-camera interview. Richie, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Megan. Thank you very much for having me on. Great to see you. Great to see you. We haven't spoken since I watched you testify in the stand and felt nothing but pride for how you handled yourself with class, with dignity, stuck to the truth. It was very clear you didn't care who it helped, who it hurt. You just told your story. You were prosecution witnesses, but I would say you made more points for the defense. I think Kyle Rittenhouse certainly feels that way. Uh, But you were consistent from the start in what you saw that night. And so kudos to you for handling it. I'm sure it was a very stressful experience. I appreciate that. Yeah, I got some kudos and some not so kudos, but I just did what I had to do and, and just try to detach myself from the rest. Yeah. So before we get to Rittenhouse and all of that in January 6th, you've always got your shirt off, your shirt's off in every... <laughs> <laughs> I knew this was going to come up. <laughs> so are you referring to the, the first American tragedy yeah, or the, the second new- one? Because <laughs> the first, right, exactly. I think it was pretty obvious why the shirt came off, but the... Yeah, the, the, the Kyle one, Rittenhouse six, thing was somebody was dying. Yes, exactly. And yeah, with respect to one six, um, I don't know if you've ever been pepper sprayed or been pepper sprayed multiple times, but... If you have, you'd know how good it feels uh, to take your shirt off in the middle of January yeah. uh, and feel that cold air. But uh, actually, the real don't make me why- direct people to your Twitter feed where your shirt <laughs> is also off a lot. Well, you can see the photo on the New York Times. It's still on that. It's still on the uh, article. So you can check that. There's Listen, a couple corrections in there now. But all you can I can still say see the is photo as, a, on there. as a red blooded American woman, I have no objection. Proceed as you like. <laughs> um, OK, let's talk about prior to those two massive events um, and the Richie McGinnis of yesteryear, right? So you went to Georgetown undergrad, which I didn't know about you until we we know each other, didn't know about that until um, 
till I read up on this interview. Go to Georgetown. Mm-hmm. And when you went to Georgetown, did you want to be a journalist? Were you getting a journalism degree or what was your background? No, I studied Arabic and Middle Eastern history. Actually, my Arabic minor was more credits than my Middle Eastern history major and studied Arabic five days a week uh, for three years and for an hour a day in class and then lived in Jordan for six months. And actually, I think the initial reason, you know, growing up outside of New York, my mom worked in Manhattan. 9-11 was a very impactful moment. I was in sixth grade. Uh, And actually, there's a bit of a deeper story there uh, regarding like me personally that same day, my mom was scheduled to go in for uh, lung cancer surgery the next day. And mm-hmm. so our, my parents had known for about a month. I told them I felt very uneasy about something. I could sense their energy was off. And they had planned to tell us on 9-11-2001. So I found out that my mom had lung cancer on 9-11 and also obviously uh, changed the broader world, not just my own personal one. So I think oh I studied Arabic partially to learn why you know not only the world changed that day, but also my own life changed. And over the course of that journey, I really came to realize that, you know, the Iraq war, everything that happened subsequently, I really viewed the media and the press as, as the linchpin where all of that was able to, to happen. Um, you know, when the WMD narrative was being spun up, it's the fourth estate's responsibility to put that in check and they failed to do so. So that kind of directed me towards, uh, interning at Al Jazeera. Then I worked at uh, MSNBC as a production assistant. And then I worked for Mark Levin, as a video editor, and then finally Daily Caller. So I, I've been across big the swings. spectrum in D.C. Yes, yeah, yes big, exactly. Big swings. How, how would you describe yourself politically? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think it's weird now in 2022 mm-hmm. to define like your political party because I think we're in the midst kind of a, of a tectonic shift in, in how exactly that's defined. And obviously Donald Trump factoring into that. But when I first moved to D.C. in 2008, I was knocking on doors for Barack Obama. And so actually volunteered for that campaign in Virginia. So if you are a Democrat out there, I am one tiny little modicum uh, responsible for turning Virginia blue. But over the promise to pull us out of Iraq, uh, you know, to change the way that we deal, uh, that America projects power in the Middle East. And all those promises, Hillary Clinton took over the State Department. I mean, look at what happened to the Middle East over the course of his eight-year presidency. You know, you had the rise of ISIS, Syria collapsed, Libya collapsed. And just to watch the way in which the Obama administration handled that, it was very um, eye-opening for me. And so I think that kind of like uh, naive innocence that I had when I first came to D.C. started to disappear. So if you're going to ask how I define myself politically now, I would say, you know, I have, um, I'm a free speech absolutist for sure. And so I think that in the weird way that would put me on the right, but also at the same time, I believe in, you know, using the power of the federal government for certain um, programs that might help, you know, the bottom of society. So I don't really know where I fall. I don't know. I, yeah. I'm, I, I voted for Kanye West in 2020. So I'm not sure where <laughs> I'm going to go in 24. <laughs> and mushrooms, right? Didn't you say? Yes. And mush- well, mushrooms <laughs> were on the ballot in DC. So I guess I probably should have clarified that, but uh, they were on the ballot in DC <laughs> and they are legal now. So um, I did vote for that as well. <laughs> okay. I mean, I think there are a lot of people who they don't know what party they're there for anymore. Everything is is so different than it used to be even just 10 years ago. Are you, how, how do you feel about having turned Virginia blue and, and helped to get Barack Obama elected? Well, I think it's, it's interesting to see what's happened in Virginia since then. So actually the, the latest uh, gubernatorial election in Virginia, I think that that shows you that in a place like Virginia, you know, democracy is functioning pretty well because the parents and, and people who really cared about a lot of these, like, um, I guess, you know, school issues and a lot of these culture war issues, they went to the polls and they spoke accordingly. So I think, you know, in that moment, um, in 2008, it's, it's, it's hard to like put myself back in those shoes, but I think, you know, I was very much caught up in the emotion of, of the moment. Barack Obama, I was a young person. He was very much hope, hope and change folks. And, um, and you can keep your doctor too. Uh, but, um, I think, you know, since then, uh, to see the way that, uh, he's been, you know, I guess places where he was elected, like Virginia has been held, those policies have been held to account. Uh, I think that's pretty encouraging actually. Mm -hmm. Um, that happened to a lot of people, right? They, they were felt inspired by him and then he actually started to govern and they said, Oh, wait a minute, (laughs) I'm having different feelings. Some of the feelings are gone. Um, now, okay, so you, you wind up at the Daily Caller, which is, you know, that was founded originally by Tucker way, way back in the day, mm-hmm. though I think he got rid of his ownership interest. Yeah, when, when he um, started coming to Fox News. So mm-hmm. 
you're working at the Daily Caller. Now, was that too right wing for you or was that I mean, like, well, um, how did you sort no. of square that? Well, interestingly, actually, someone I bartended with because I bartended while I was working at NBC uh, as a side job and a little bit um, once I started at Levin. And, and uh, so I was bartending with this guy and I saw him during the 2016 election doing these live streams on the Daily Caller and getting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of views. And the studio was like janky and I'm watching it uh, from my from my uh, office at Levin TV. And I'm like, wow, there's something here. I went in for an interview. I actually got hit in a hockey game the night before and I had 28 fresh stitches in my face at oh 8 a.m., like still bleeding. And I called him in the morning. I was like, I don't know if I can make the interview. I got all these stitches. He's like, no, the boss is going to love it. And I went in there and just the atmosphere in the newsroom was so open. Everyone was kind of like shouting at me. Like, you know, it was it was really exciting. It was I just being there. I felt like I could say whatever I wanted in that newsroom. And I didn't feel like yeah. coming in as somebody who wasn't like a buttoned up conservative, uh, you know, was some kind of thing that they looked down upon in the newsroom. And secondarily, I think with, you know, Tucker leaving, he's kind of, uh, believe it or not, I, I guess this is people at home might not realize, but he was kind of a creative force at the caller just because Tucker, he started it with his roommate, Neil Patel, who's still the CEO. And Neil's very type A. Tucker's not quite as type A. So I starting the video program there kind of actually part of my job was creating this little kind of, um, I guess, creative enclave. And a lot of our creatives that we hired weren't necessarily buttoned up conservatives, in fact, far from it. So I was like, Neil, we got no dress code. We're coming in in hoodies. We're video guys. We're artists. We're going to express ourselves. And they were really receptive to that. So I think uh, in a weird way, the Daily Caller is representative of the fact that uh, the tectonic shift that I'm talking about when I was growing up, being a lefty meant you were pro free speech. And and I think mm. at least the NBC newsroom, other um, more quote unquote liberal newsrooms, you know, won't have that kind of open atmosphere. Yeah, in in my experience, NBC is not willing to an open discussion of controversial <laughs> yeah. issues. I would just, you know, I just it's my experience. You definitely have some familiarity as well, exactly. <laughs> um, but you know, speaking of Tucker, he also went from MSNBC, right? He, well, he'd been at MS, he he'd been at CNN, he got fired. He wound up at Fox. Mm-hmm. That's when I, he started like, the caller. Yep, and right when I signed my contract is right when, literally May tenth, uh, two thousand seventeen, right when Tucker started in that eight PM slot, taking over for Bill O'Reilly, and before then. You know, he wasn't kind of the villain slash hero uh, that he is today in the media landscape. And so to see like the toothpaste coming out of the tube during the Trump years of not only Trump, but, you know, Tucker and and the way that he was treated uh, for having, you know, uh, his opinions about what was going on uh, is very eye opening for me. And then obviously the way that the caller was interpreted as a result of Tucker taking that front stage, I obviously uh was on the receding end of a lot of those feelings because, you know, during the riots, for example, people have a certain idea. Uh, you must be just like Tucker Carlson. You must think everything the same. But actually, you know, it's a very open minded uh, newsroom. Yeah. And one of the other thing about Tucker is, too, I, what I find entertaining about him is you, you kind of never know where he's going to come down on an issue. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah. that's what's interesting about him. He's no, he's nobody's, you know, dog and pony show like he mm-hmm. he will turn on you like tomorrow if he thinks you've done something stupid. If you're a politician who's put yourself on the field, he doesn't punch down. But um, mm-hmm. and I like that about him. And people think he's like. You know, he, like a Hannity, you know, Hannity's mm-hmm. reliably right wing. Yes, yes, Tucker's, exactly. Tucker's not. And the Daily Caller's grown into a really interesting news organization with reporters I would 100% steal if I were to expand <laughs> my devil may care media, which one day I may. Um, in any event, so that's interesting. And and you, but like, I got to know you, you came to my house for an interview that we did one time. And, but I got to know your work just because you were sort of, I don't know if we can call it guerrilla uh, news gathering because you're yeah. with a news organization, but you were just freaking not afraid you were putting yourself in the middle of all that shit it was like the dangerous stuff that was happening the more dangerous the better you you were like a moth to the flame for for the past three years wouldn't you say well honestly i'm gonna give a lot of credit to shelby because shelby uh you know shelby she's uh actually a white house correspondent at the daily caller and she is now white house uh, correspondent, but she's a former pro tennis player. And when all those riots started, she was actually the one who uh, went to our editor in chief and she was like, I'm going to go out and cover these. And he's like, you're a girl, you know, you can't do that. And uh, she was like, I'm going to go whether you like it or not. And that first weekend I was actually in New York and I returned on June 1st, which was the Trump uh, Bible photo op day. And oh. over that weekend, Shelby was like walking into stores as they were actively being looted along with uh, Jorge who was one of our interns. And so mm-hmm. Shelby was really like, the tenacious one who was getting out there and getting into the mix. And kind of my job was 
between Shelby and Jorge, making sure that the video got up, that everything was delivered and, and recording, you know, focusing more on the video in these protest zones. And, uh, so we had a couple of situations, you know, where, where Shelby's, uh, standing tall and I'm just like bear hugging her and dragging her out of there. Cause <laughs> I'm like, you're not the one who's going to get punched in the head first. They, they punched the guy in the head first for sure. But actually <laughs> Jeff told Shelby or told me when we went out there, he said, if Shelby gets a black eye, and you're not in the ICU, I'll kill you myself. And he's a Marine, so <laughs> you got to take that with a grain of salt. But um, it was definitely, I guess, uh, we didn't realize how things were going to turn out at the very beginning. It was a great but- team. No, and weren't you weren't you guys getting shit from some people on the left for doing it? Like they were accusing mm-hmm. you of like oh, yeah. manufacturing it. I'm trying to remember yes. exactly the contrary, but it was like, oh, you're making it happen as opposed to just documenting it with your camera, it, yes. something along those lines. It was a bunch of nonsense from the left wing press that didn't have the balls to cover it at all. Yeah. And we saw a lot of that after Kenosha, after one six. And actually in Kenosha, I was um, took a lot of crap from the uh, right wing because I was wearing a BLM shirt that night, which actually I used to try to uh, save Joseph Rosenbaum, which obviously those efforts failed. But wearing that shirt, that's exactly what you're talking about. Our role was to be a fly on the wall for the American public, just using our cell phones, not you know becoming part of the story by coming in with a big camera. And in order to do that, you kind of just had to blend in and you know uh, hunker down with the protesters, rioters. If you want to elicit you know their truth, why they think they're out there, then you you kind of have to embed with them rather than you know coming in with a big camera and saying you know so why is this a party like atmosphere? Oh, my God. It's because of you that we know a lot of the violence that happened at these BLM riots. I mean, you're you're reporting your fearlessness and getting in the mix. It's like because of your T-shirt at a thing where you were trying to blend in. People are trying to say people know nothing about you. (laughs) It's like they make Mm -hmm. all sorts of assumptions from The New York Times uh, to the people who are ripping on you guys for your, Mm -hmm. you know, journalism uh, during those riots. Um, uh, What I have seen is an honest journalist who's actually fearless in getting us the story consistently with you consistently is one of the reasons i wanted to have you on so um okay so let's fa- flash forward to our first big flash point and um that is the kenosha wisconsin riot um that involved kyle Ritt- rittenhouse there as mm-hmm. what he viewed as a protector of a business and somebody there to pr- potentially provide aid now that's a piece of his story again that we know thanks to Richie McGinnis. Okay, we know that because Richie was there, and Richie, just to remind the audience, was the guy who got an interview with Kyle, who you didn't know from Adam, uh, that night before the violence started, like 15 minutes before the violence started. You saw this kid. You're there to document the news. This is just to remind the audience again. Those riots happened in the wake of Jacob Blake being shot in Kenosha by. Uh, seven times by a police officer. He was resisting arrest. This is the one that uh, Kamala Harris called a hero and went to visit and paid the bail for and all and the people who, all that stuff. So the riots happened in Kenosha after Jacob Blake was shot. By the way, it's still come out. It's come out since that he had a knife and he threatened the police officers. So anyway, that's, you know, like so many of these riots, it's like, you didn't know the full story. Go, go back. Go sit on your couch. Yeah. There's no reason to burn shit. Jacob Blake resisted arrest, punched a cop, and pulled a knife on him. All right? Take a seat. Anywho, you go, you cover the thing, and you see Kyle Rittenhouse, and just tell us how that started and what your impressions yeah. of him were. I think that that's, that story is very interesting because basically the way that I came to talk to Kyle actually started the night before. Shelby and I were walking past that same business that Kyle was in front of when I interviewed him, which is one of the car source businesses that he was defending. That's the car source one. And actually the shooting took place in another car source lot, which is just up the street. So we saw that business, all the cars in front of it were burning. And there were guys with a one guy with a power washer and no joke, people with buckets and trash cans full of water, dumping them on these burning cars. And so we interviewed the guy as he's power washing and and we asked him why he was there. And he basically told us that uh, he was hired to go out there because the fire department wasn't responding. And so the next day we were in front of the courthouse covering all the violence, you know, the tear gas came out, they pushed everybody back from the fence, very standard kind of situation happening in front of whatever building it is that they're trying to, you know, uh, burn or whatever they're trying to do, put graffiti on, throw fireworks at. And so they get pushed away from that courthouse and end up in front of that car source business. And I went inside because there was such poor internet to try to get on the Wi-Fi to get all of that coverage of what happened in front of the courthouse up. And I saw these armed individuals in front of that same business on Twitter. And I was like, oh, I have to go. I just dropped what I was doing. And I walked straight out the hotel, which is right next to that business, the Stella Hotel, and walked 
right out there and Kyle was standing in front of everybody else. And I basically just said, Hey, does anybody want to do an interview about why you guys are out here? And Kyle immediately volunteered himself. And that is where he told you the following, which would wind up becoming relevant uh, later at his trial for having shot three people, two of whom died. Here's soundbite one. So people are getting injured. And our job is to protect this business. And part of my job is to also help people. If there's somebody hurt, I'm running into harm's way. That's why I have my rifle, because I need to protect myself, obviously. But I also have my med kit. That's you. That's your, that's your interview. Mm-hmm. I, that's what's that's so crazy. big because it, it would have been one thing, Richie, if he had just take, taken the stand and said, I went there to help people. Uh, that's what, That was my intention. It's quite another if you've got him on camera before anything happened telling some journalist. You know what I mean? It was very helpful mm-hmm. to him that you and he had that exchange. Yeah, and the interesting thing is when I after the shooting, I saw so much different misinformation being passed around about how the shooting actually took place, having been so close to it. You know, I knew what happened because it was 10 feet in front of me. But the moment that I went out and relayed information like that to the public, uh, the first show I went on was Tucker's show. It, it was immediately started to be distorted. You know, McGinnis supported the conservative claim that Rittenhouse acted in self-defense. And it's like, no, I literally told him why Kyle told me he was there 13 minutes before the shooting. And so those kind of objective observations and facts and quotes it's it just goes to show how they get manipulated to kind of fit whatever narrative agenda um, that particular news outlet wants to mold. I mean, this is so critical because, it, it, you know, I understand what Kyle went through. And for him, this is absolutely about a, a criminal justice tra- travesty averted. But this is also very much a media story and mm-hmm. a Democrat spin story because it wasn't just the media pile on, piling on Kyle Rittenhouse. It was everyone right up to the president of the United States. I mean, mm-hmm. the, 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 trying to tell us that he was a white supremacist in a case in which n- no black people were shot, right? Like this mm-hmm. wasn't about Kyle going there and hurting black people. All of the people who were shot were white. Kyle's white. It was on the heels of a, a black man being shot by police. Mm-hmm. But he was there to keep the peace, right, from from rioters in a city. I, I've said before, I don't think that was a good idea for a 17 year old to show up there uh, and try to keep the peace. But the truth is, the the governor wasn't doing it. So there were a lot of people like Kyle who thought, I have an obligation to go protect this city. Absolutely. And I think that is the first failure where the institutions that are supposed to protect those businesses, like the fire department and the police department, obviously failed. And the fact that the, they had, for example, an FBI surveillance plane flying over this protest, the fact that they had drones flying over it, it goes to show that, you know, the federal government, federal law enforcement, they knew that this was getting bad. I mean, this is the third night of rioting. So why is it that with everybody paying that much attention to it in our federal uh, law enforcement agencies, why is it that their, their law enforcement in general was so absent from, you know, all of those businesses that were getting burned down? Why is it? I, I mean, it's, it's a very good question. And I've, that actually is something that I'm trying to, you know, dig a little bit deeper to figure out exact because that's not my uh, area of expertise. Kind of like, you know, how exactly the decisions were made for the National Guard for, you know, did the governor um, allow this to happen? Did it was it offered? So I'm that there will be more of that, and I'm digging more into that. But I think that's definitely the first critical failure that even you know, a kid like Kyle Rittenhouse would think that he should go out in the first place. Didn't we have a? Didn't we have a? a- Blue state governor, a Democratic governor who yes. didn't want to upset uh, yep. the BLM crowd by looking over militarized in the face of these riots. He'd yep. rather let the city burn. He didn't he didn't care. And it, it's really interesting for me too, having seen the protests across the country, the way that different law enforcement handles, you know, civil unrest. And in DC, I mean, these guys deal with it obviously more than anybody. They know what to do. I mean, they are keeping this crowd effectively like contained on the street. There's police on both sides. So if parts of those crowds are going down side streets, they have eyes on, you know, they're following them. They're extremely organized. They protect the protesters from car traffic, all that different stuff. In this sleepy city, Kenosha, they don't know how to do that. So the way that they dealt with it was far less, you know, effective, far less professional. They were using like long range acute, uh, acoustic devices like these loud sirens. Uh, They were using a lot of tear gas, a lot of pepper balls. And in D.C., you don't see they kind of treat the 
the group with um, almost white gloves a little bit more, you know, almost treat them like a, a kindergarten class that they're taking on a field trip. And but they have so much uh, law enforcement overseeing it and making sure that people who leave are, are being watched, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there was none of that in Kenosha. And I, no. I don't necessarily blame the police there because they don't know how to handle those kind of situations. But moving forward, it's like, you know, who do we have who knows how to do that? Yeah, I mean. I don't think Kyle made a good decision to go there that night. I think he admits that too, but you can understand that people in and around the area felt like nobody was there to protect the businesses, the people that they had just surrendered to rioters who we now know are rioting over nothing. Honestly, over mm -hmm. nothing. Jacob Blake was the aggressor, right? We know that now. So it's like, wait for the facts to play out. None of this had to happen. So you not only spoke to Kyle moments before he found himself em embroiled in these three situations, but you were embroiled in the first one. And I know this was traumatic for you as a as a human, as a man. Um, mm -hmm. The first man that Kyle shot, I think we can stipulate, was not a good man. Um, mm -hmm. Joseph Rosenbaum was a convicted child molester. Um, that's Absolutely. not to say he deserved to be shot, but he was the aggressor and Kyle shot him in self-defense. So, you know, so legally he deserved to be shot. But that doesn't make it any easier for you mm -hmm. to hold the man's head as he's bleeding and dying. So can we just start from with that yeah. aspect of it? Exactly. Well, so after the trial, you know, I, I've obviously stayed silent since then, but I'm kind of envisioning what my role is now that it's no longer witness. And I saw all that firsthand. And when I saw it, I didn't know anything about his background. I didn't know what that guy's criminal history was. I wasn't going to, even if I had have asked him, you know, there was blood in his lungs. He couldn't say anything. So my only goal there was really to comfort him. And actually my dad passed away right when I started at the Daily Caller. And I, I had an experience when he passed away where our whole family was there. We got him home from the hospital. He saw the nurse leave the room and he knew that was his time to go. And we all hugged him. My older brother, who's an ER doc, uh, as well, he he put a stethoscope on his heart, and we we were telling him stories and and holding him as he passed away. Oh. And he chose to leave, like he saw the nurse leave, and he chose to leave the world in that moment. And so there was a certain peace there, and uh, it was the exact opposite with Joseph Rosenbaum. And I think that there's a very, um, I guess, disturbing and interesting parallel there, which is, you know, my dad, uh, I think, felt like he was ready to go. He felt like his boys were ready to go out into the world, and he had done his job. And I think that that's an example of, you know, a life fulfilled in America. And Joseph Rosenbaum is an example of, of a life completely unfulfilled. And he was abused, sexually abused, actually at a young age. And so by his stepdad. And so to see actually some of the people that he sexually abused are also now incarcerated. So that kind of cycle of tragedy that surrounded his family is expanding beyond his own family. And my only goal now moving forward is just to put that tragedy what happened in the actual moment the human suffering that took place regardless of what this guy's criminal history is because in america you know we believe that everybody is born in the image of god and that up until the moment that they die they have the opportunity to repent for what they've done and you know he left the world knowing that he had done bad things and i saw it in his eyes i saw that regret and i i think just conveying that to the public that regret uh is is an important thing because in America, everybody wants, you know, to die the way that my dad did, which is with their family uh, and loved ones surrounding him and not the way that Rosenbaum did. And so using those two endings um, kind of in parallel, I think it, it it goes to show that you should take your decisions in life extremely seriously. But can I ask you, because do you put that on Kyle or on Rosenbaum? Well, that's I think that's a great question um, that I'm trying to unpack. And I think that that was part of what that piece got towards uh not necessarily the criminal side of it but the more moral side of it and moving forward it's like what kind of behavior do we want to encourage who are the people that we're looking up to in this situation you know i think that uh joseph rosenbaum obviously i stated in court he screamed fuck you right before he went for the weapon and the way that he said fuck you i will never forget it i mean there's so much anger behind those words and i don't know what would have happened if he had to grab that weapon i, I don't think it would have turned out well for kyle rittenhouse in any way shape or form um, but with all that being said, you know, that situation going out there, uh, and this is something I tried to put into words, but it's almost difficult to express how stupid Kyle going away from that business alone with a fire extinguisher in one hand with his med pack. And, you know, originally, uh, Balch was with him. Ryan Balch was with him and he was walking alongside actually, 
me, Kyle, and Bolch were all walking. And actually, I went to talk to some individuals who were shouting at Kyle because he was going, medical, medical. And I would say like 90% of the people in the crowd, you can see in parts of my video, looking at him very, very angrily. And he just was completely naive, had no clue the negative uh, looks that he was getting, all the all the yells. So uh, these four um, guys who yelled at him, I wanted to interview them and see why they were mad at him. And I went to talk to them, and that's when I parted ways with Kyle. Over the course of that time, him and Bulch got separated, and he ran off on his own down to another fire at the other car source lot. And he actually, it came out in court, he asked some of the under, other individuals if they wanted to come, and they declined. So he went out there alone with a fire extinguisher, a med kit, and a rifle. And in that instance, you know, he's trying to play not only medic, not only fireman, but also cop. And so the level of stupidity of that decision, I think, is something that uh, conservatives would want to overlook and that, you know, uh, the lefties would want to emphasize. And then the Rosenbaum aspect of him screaming, fuck you, going for the weapon and and missing and being shot. Um, and what would have happened if he had gotten that rifle? That's something that the, you know it's basically one side or the other it's you're highlighting certain facts based upon what mm. your agenda is what right, you know, and it's more complicated it's right you're, you're trying to point out it's more complicated yes i get it i totally get this um 100 richie i feel like i defended kyle on a, from a legal perspective every day uh i just it was very clearly a self-defense case and he was being railroaded and thank god those jurors did the right thing and justice prevailed but we can talk honestly about whether this was a good idea for a 17 year old mm -hmm. to try to go there and keep the peace because, you know, you point out some of the, the things he failed to observe. That's in part due to his youth, his inexperience. Exactly. A 17 year old doesn't yes. know shit. They don't know anything. You're, mm -hmm. you just, I don't know, how old were you when this went down? Uh, 32, 30, no, okay, I was so 31. You, so you've got, you know, over 10 years on the, on the guy, almost, almost 15 years on him. You're a journalist. You've been in rough spots. You've, you know, seen a bit of the world. And you're seeing things he's not seeing. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we don't generally put somebody out in this kind of situation to keep mm -hmm. the peace without some training like we give to law mm -hmm. enforcement officers or the National Guard. And again, we talked about the fact that they weren't sent. But that there's a reason why we don't send 17-year-old minors out there with no training to keep yeah. the peace in this way. They're, they're not sophisticated in, in this kind of situation. And, and what you're telling me is you could see it and you could see how it was going to play into Kyle's kyle's being in danger never mind other people. yes and I, I have regret honestly i was playing the role of fly on the wall journalist there if it had been my younger brother the moment that i saw him i would have dragged him out by his ear so uh, thinking about the you know differences in those roles obviously after rosenbaum was shot i dropped my role as journalist but i i almost you know I, i'm not almost i mean i think about it all the time you know if i had done it earlier but that really, it's not our role to go out there and like admonish the people. You know, people always say, oh, no. and he gave this rioter a friendly interview or whatever. It's like, what am I going to tell him? Did you know that you're not allowed to burn that, burn, burn down that building? <laughs> um, right. so it's and actually on that night in Kenosha, uh, there was one attempted mugging and on the previous night, there was another one guys trying to take my phone off of me. And what do I do in that situation? You know, you create a little bit of distraction. Oh yeah, this thing's really, and then you're running, you're, you're mm. looking at your, your exit point and you're gone and you're sprinting until there's nobody behind you. No, they, um, they wanted they wanted Brian Stelter journalism. You better go home right now yes, or I'm going to report exactly. you to the principal. Right. And we saw how that ended for him. Like, yes. All during right. during the insurrection, I was criticized for giving the guy smoking weed a friendly interview. And it's like, oh what am I God. supposed to tell him? You're not, not allowed to smoke weed in the Capitol. Is that what I'm supposed to tell him? <laughs> Is that, that's now my job. By the way, I voted for the shrooms. All right. Stand by. Yeah. Richie. <laughs> we're going to we're going to show you the video. Um, that Richie was involved in and talk about. Um, now there's, there's blowback on him for saying what he just said. Uh, so we'll get into that in January 6th as well. Don't go away. Well, as everyone's going back to school over the next couple of weeks, you have the chance to do some good by helping feed children who are facing hunger and food insecurity. Our partner, Good Ranchers, is on a mission to donate 100,000 high-quality meals to young children who often go unfed or who are malnourished from poor access to nutritious food. You can join this campaign by ordering a box of 100% American meat. Every order will contribute meals to the cause and make a huge difference in the lives of these kids. Good Ranchers is an award-winning food delivery service that brings 100% American meat and seafood right to your door. They source the best of American farms so that you can get the highest quality food possible and trust what you're feeding your family every time. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash Megan to join the movement today. You'll get $30 off your order, free shipping, 
and donate food to children in need. Giving back never felt or tasted so good. Let's help them hit and pass their goal of 100,000 meals donated. Go to goodranchers.com slash Megan or just use that code M-E-G-Y-N at checkout. Change the future one meal at a time with Good Ranchers. Goodranchers.com slash M-E-G-Y-N. So, Richie, there was this moment, and we'll get to your thoughts on Kyle in one second, but there was this moment um, where you... Uh, capturing the event on camera and so on, also become part of the event. And that is when Joseph Rosenbaum, uh, who would wind up dead that night, got into the scuffle with Kyle Rittenhouse. And we're just going to show the audience um, the video, and maybe you can explain, like, you can see it too, maybe you can explain Mm -hmm. where you are as we watch this. This is like, because this guy, Rosenbaum, ran after Kyle, and um, Mm -hmm. Kyle then had a confrontation with him. Let's let's show Mm -hmm. it. Maybe you can talk us through it. Yep. The parking lot. We're seeing nothing yet. Hold on, we're gonna re rack it. Yeah, that was for the it. listening right audience. Right. Yeah, for the listening audience, we're gonna we gotta re rack it at the end. <laughs> we're just gonna show the um the parking lot where this took place. All right, here we go. There's a figure in the foreground. Who's that? That guy right in the foreground is Kyle. Boom, there's Rosenbaum dead, and that's me right back behind there. That's you with or, the dark shorts. Obviously he's still alive at the, that um so I was actually wearing uh, pants that actually belonged to my dad, which I found in his closet after he passed away. So they're my lucky riot oh. pants. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. So you that, were right so there. I mean, you can... couldn't be more of an eyewitness to that actual shooting. Yes. And my boss will never let me hear the end of it, but I actually was on the phone with Shelby because I heard some screaming. I saw Kyle running up the street with the fire extinguisher and assumed that something was about to go down. So I called Shelby up and I was like, where are you? It sounds like something dangerous is going to happen. And actually, I was jogging up, and I jogged up to that confrontation started with some people yelling. The moment I heard that yelling, I said, oh, uh, some ex- expletive I can't remember. I got to go to Shelby. I hung up on her, and I thought I went to my cam- – I went, did go to my camera app. I thought I went to the video, but I actually took a live photo of the ground. So you can see me with my hands up. I thought I was filming, but I actually took a live photo. So mm. um, in that instance, uh, after he was shot, you know, all of that went out the window anyways. Whose video was that? That one right there that you saw from the air, that was uh, federal law enforcement had FBI, a surveillance yeah. drone. Um, yeah. But then the first one that you saw, that that was Drew Hernandez, who was also traveling around the country, uh, you know, covering all this stuff. Uh, independent journalist who, I mean, that just goes to show he works for um, TPUSA now, but he, at, I believe at the time he was independent. And, you know, basically the group of people who were there at that time who were, who were covering the event, I'd seen those people all around the country, you know, yeah. Drew Hernandez, uh, Brennan Gutenschwager, Elijah Schaefer, me, Shelby, Jorge and Julio Rosas. Uh, we, you yeah. know, saw each other in all these different zones. And it's like, it was the, the running joke was like, we all come from different parts of the media, but like none of us are from the corporate media. <laughs> yeah. We had a lot of those guys on the show actually during this whole thing. You couldn't do it cause you were an actual witness. Uh, most of those guys were not, but, um, so, so you take the stand. You were called as a prosecution witness, which was interesting because you were definitely, I think, more helpful net net for the defense. And the prosecutor really wanted you to say that Joseph Rosenbaum was falling into mm-hmm. Kyle yes. when yeah. Kyle shot him, mm-hmm. and you you were using the word lunge, and he was mm-hmm. trying to kind of get you on it um, yes. based on an interview you'd given to Tucker shortly after yep. the incident that you referenced mm-hmm. earlier in this show. Uh, where I think you would use both terms and the prosecutor yes. preferred the one he preferred the yep. one that made Rosenbaum sound more innocent. Mm-hmm. And we have a little bit of how that went. Watch. No, we don't. Yes, it is. It's, we don't. I'm <laughs> listening arguing with my producer. Yes. Yeah, so, I can reenact it. Yes, this is the sound bite. Well, let's play it. Sound by three. And you've already established that after the shooting, Mr. Rosenbaum never says a word. Correct. Correct. You don't know, as you sit here today, what Mr. Rosenbaum was thinking, do you? Yeah, you mean at the time of the shooting? Yes. Or at any point in his life. I mean, you have no idea what Mr. Rosenbaum was ever thinking at any point in his life. You have never been inside his head. You never met him before. You don't know. I've never even, I never exchanged words with him, if that's what your question is. So your interpretation of what he was trying to do or what he was intending to do or anything along those lines is complete guesswork, isn't it? 
Um, well, he said, fuck you, and then he reached for the weapon. I mean, that, that was another moment. My producer's correct, but that was critical. I mean, that was critical, because you wouldn't, he wanted you to give it to him. I had no idea what was mm. in his head. And as the eyewitness, the closest thing other than Kyle or Rosenbaum, you had a very different take. Mm -hmm. And that was where he was trying to get me was basically he went from lunging for the front portion of the rifle, which he missed, to then there's just air. So not only the fact that he got shot and that would, you know, conceivably keep him from being able to put his foot out to stop himself from then falling once he missed. So like hashing that out, I mean, it's very simple if you think about it, like just with kind of in normal terms but in the courtroom obviously he was trying to get me on my words and i think there was a lot of that going on not only in the courtroom in that adversarial system but in the adversarial system that exists in our media so it was a weird almost like being in the courtroom was almost like a weird kind of um i guess parallel experience to being in, you know in between the two sides of the media mm -hmm. oh i'm sure i mean his attempt to try, to try to make rosenbaum appear like oh he just stumbled into the gun and kyle this hothead reacted it, it failed but it failed in large part thanks to you i mean the jurors heard you say i heard him yell fuck you as he reached for the gun i mean that's that's pretty powerful mm -hmm. of course kyle can say that too but that's it's not the same as having a, a third party there who has no dog mm -hmm. in this hunt you know say that so it was critical exactly but so let's get to so kyle was acquitted thank god and his emotions when he was found not guilty. I mean, who could forget the sight of him going down? He was just overcome. We were live in the air when the verdict was read and just so, so moving. I, I was moved emotionally myself watching mm it. Um, and then you, now you've come out with uh, an op-ed and it's interesting to me, Richie, I don't understand. You tell me what's happening because you're, mm -hmm. I read that you're leaving the Daily Wire. You post it in Newsweek, which by the way, Caller, does post... Yeah. Daily Caller. Daily Caller, yeah, sorry. Daily mm -hmm. Caller. Um, Newsweek does post a lot of stuff from the right from the right now these days. It's not wholly left. So just because you went, it's not mm -hmm. like you went to New York Magazine, right? And then we yeah. know, like, what's Richie doing? So you post it in Newsweek. They, Mike, Mike Davis has had some. Anyway, my point is, um, we know nothing from the fact that this is in Newsweek. But what you say in Newsweek is, I was in Kenosha two years ago. Kyle Rittenhouse is not a hero. And you write in the piece that... Um, he was either presented broadly as a force for good or evil. In my view, Kyle Rittenhouse was neither. And some on the right are mad at you. <laughs> they're they're mm. pissed off that you said that about Kyle, that mm. they feel like you're taking shots with him mm. and even potentially siding with somebody like Rosenbaum because of things that you said, like what you just said on this show. Um, so how, how do you respond to people who are ticked off that you don't want to celebrate Kyle Rittenhouse? Well, I think for one, the one thing that they might not understand is that perhaps one of the things that made my testimony stronger was the fact that, you know, I wasn't, I, I wasn't overtly like a Kyle Rittenhouse fan or I wasn't out there to get him off. I was out there to tell the truth. And so that was my role as witness. You know, I, I told the facts and I tried not to, you know, cast my own opinions out there because I, I wanted just to stick to the facts and I don't want any of that to interfere with my testimony. But after that is all over, you know, I, I stayed quiet. Every, you know, everybody was, some people were very angry about the results of the election. Some people, I mean, the results of the, um, of the court case, uh, some people were obviously elated. So I decided to wait and I waited nine, nine months about. And on that anniversary, you know, I view my role moving forward as, uh, returning back to that role of, like a journalist and, and a person who was there and a human being who experienced it. And when people read about it in 20 years, you know, I just, I wanted to put that personal experience on paper, how I encountered Kyle Rittenhouse, how I saw him in that zone. And then, you know, how Joseph Rosenbaum, not knowing his criminal history, how I experienced that in that moment. So, you know, everybody, I got called a pedo lover, probably, I don't know, hundreds of times this last week. I expected all that to happen. I knew it would, but my, my goal was to show that in the moment, you know, the way that you experience these things is different from the way that it's then interpreted by the media, the way that, you know, all the armchair quarterbacks say you should have done this or that. I just wanted to provide my human uh, perspective on that. And obviously I think the results, you know, the, the response to it kind of proved the thesis of the article, which is it's like, you know, we had these two trenches. Now every story is interpreted through 
one uh, of those two partisan lenses. And if you go to try to climb up out of that trench and stand up in no man's land and, and you know, shout to one side or the other, you're going to get blasted. So mm-hmm. um, I think that the the response really kind of proved that thesis. And I'm not, you know, asking for any sim- I knew exactly what was going to happen when I posted it. And I wasn't doing it to take a shot at Kyle Rittenhouse. I quite literally said he's he's not a hero. He's also not a villain. And I think that that's the problem is that he was cast as either one or the other. And, you know, I think what the right did was see that people were calling him a white supremacist, see that the the left was calling him a white supremacist and respond by saying, well, if they're going to call him that, then I'm going to call him a hero. And I think that that aspect of the rea- reactionary right is kind of what I was pushing back on. It's like you can't just abandon your, your whatever principles you claim to have, for example, family values, parents who should don't let their 17 year old kids go out uh, armed to riots. Um, but secondarily, just, well, if they did that, then you know that means that us responding in kind is okay and i think conservatives always used to be the ones who were like don't yell at politicians in the street you know have a certain aspect of civil society that you preserve and now you see all conservatives you know shouting at politicians and and my question is is like what's the end result of that like if the left goes lower and then the right responds by going low as well well that sounds like a death spiral into something that's very bad so mm. I just uh, try to, you know, stand up and and say what I experienced, and um, you know, I I expected the results, so uh, mm. I think you know, well, moving forward, it's 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 a good learning lesson. I thought Kyle himself did a pretty good job after the verdict in not being so too self congratulatory or leaning too far into, you know, I'm a hero. Like he he mm. didn't really do much yes. of that, and that like, was not it was you know, I, yes, stepping back, like. After the fact, I I could have been more clear about the fact that really it was the media that took Rittenhouse and turned him into that hero. And he's just a kid. You know, now he's yeah. by that point, he was 18. So he was technically an adult. But even still, you know, he was just getting sucked up by conservative ink and they were using him um, just for the, you know, to score their own uh, points on the board after he was acquitted. And, I actually and, and let me just show what show the audience what you're talking about, because in your piece, oh, yeah. you, you, you write a month after the trial came Turning Point USA's America Fest, uh, where they wanted you to participate, but you declined. You knew that they were going to surprise the audience with Kyle. And it led to we have it right. We have this moment. Yeah, where he came out, we'll just play it now um, while I continue speaking, but he came out and there's like pyrotechnics and there's spotlights and. He got a hero's welcome for sure, and I get any. I can see you know you you had a problem with that. To me, I saw that as like they're applauding his mm-hmm. courage in having had to sit there for day after day, thinking he might be going to jail for the rest of his life. It's about a martyr less than a yeah. hero, in in my view. Yeah, I think that that's a very that's a very fair point. And Drew Hernandez, actually, who was on that panel, who, like I said, I was traveling around with him. Um, he said something similar on Tim Pool the other night. And look, that's completely fine. I totally understand that perspective. And I also can't unpack, like, here's the thing is when a tragedy happens, you know, everybody says, oh, well, he had this criminal history and blah, blah, blah. I can't unlive that experience. And so my goal was to, you know, the way that I felt when I saw that, having one of the people that he shot die in my arms was sick. And so I think that all I wanted to do in that providing that anecdote and the way that I felt when I saw it was to identify the fact that people who are close to these tragedies, you know, that human side of it is something that gets completely lost. And whether it's one side or the other, the human beings who are caught up in the midst of that are kind of, they do, they become these caricatures who are no longer human beings, according to the media. That's the thing. So like when I see people attacking you for this opinion piece, for what you're saying here, I want them to remember you've been through your own trauma. You've been through your own trauma in this whole thing, trying to do the right thing, trying to bring us the news that was being snuffed out by too many in the mainstream and found yourself in a really hard situation where not only did you witness the shooting and were in danger yourself, but again, not knowing who Joseph Rosenbaum was or anything about his criminal history, held him as he died in your arms after you'd already lost your dad in not the same way, but it's, you know, disturbingly, eerily mm-hmm. similar circumstances, sort of. So I get it, Richie. I, I understand exactly where you're coming from. I will say um, we reached out to Kyle and 
asked him for his response to your op-ed and told him you're coming on today. And I'll just leave that as the tease because we just did get a response. And that's where we'll pick it up <laughs> right after this quick commercial break. Uh, we'll be right back with Richie McGinnis and we'll talk about January 6th as well. Uh, and don't forget, folks, you can find The Megan Kelly Show live on Sirius XM Triumph Channel 111 every weekday at noon east and the full video show and clips by subscribing to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Megan Kelly. All right, now I got a favor to ask you. Can you go there? Can you sign up if you haven't yet? Because we are now 2,000 subscribers away from hitting the 500,000 mark, which is exciting because we did that all in the past year. We've only been video for a year. And it would be great if on August 31st, we could get over that hump. So do me a favor, go to youtube.com slash Megan Kelly, subscribe now. Do you ever wonder if your vitamins are working? Clinical studies show Healthy Cell's new ingestible gel technology called Microgel delivers maximum nutrient absorption 165% more than you get with tablets. It tastes great too. It's actually hard to make vitamin liquids or gels taste good naturally, but Healthy Cell products are the best tasting pill-free supplements on the market today. Go pill-free and get up to 15 pills worth of nutrients in one ultra-absorption gel pack, saving you money and time and giving you effective doses. Take a single great tasting gel pack at home or on the go. It's great for travel. You can mix it into drinks or you can blend it into smoothies. Old-fashioned tablets, capsules, and powders contain synthetic other ingredients like binding glues, flow agents, fillers, and coatings that could irritate your gut. Plus, this product is made in the USA. Visit HealthyCell.com slash Megan or just use the code Megan when you check out for 20% off your very first order. So Richie, we reached out to Kyle for his response to your op-ed in Newsweek and to what we anticipated would be your appearance here today. And it was sort of an interesting series of events. His spokesperson, David Hancock, responded first. And then in came a lengthier statement from David Hancock. And then in came a statement from Kyle himself. So I kind of have sort of three responses to go over with you. First came this from David Hancock, one paragraph only. Um, Kyle wishes, wishes Richie the best as he tries to reinvent himself and will always be thankful that Richie was honest and sincere when it mattered the most, not just for Kyle, but for America. Okay, so that was number one. Uh, David has since added a second paragraph to that. Uh, right, that I'm reads, ready. that reads, Kyle thought waiting until the two-year anniversary of Kenosha to pander to the left with selective storytelling was painfully transparent, but pretending the thugs who attacked him were now victims was hypocritical and unprincipled. So that's him to you. Um, mm -hmm. He's referring to your behavior. Kyle, this is from him directly, writes as follows, quote, Unfortunately, Richie's latest story leaves a lot of important details out, including my intentions to help others while I was there, or the fact that I was chased down and assaulted by an armed mob. I am grateful he told the truth when it mattered. His new story doesn't change the facts of that day. I am forever grateful for the justice system for seeing my innocence in all of this. So what do you make of it? You've left out a lot of details, including his mm -hmm. intentions. Um, grateful you told the truth when it mattered. You now have a new story that they think is hypocritical, unprincipled, and painfully transparent as you attempt to, quote, mm -hmm. pander to the left. Mm -hmm. Well, see, that's what I was talking about earlier, which is if you, you know, step outside of, you know, that trench, then you're going to basically be cast into the other one. And so when I was during the trial, you know, people were calling me a right wing conservative. And now, um, people are saying that I'm pandering to the left with this new piece. I mean, I think that Kyle, you know, that response, uh, I think that that's a very fair contention. Uh, I did include uh, details of why he said he stated that he was there. Um, he stated, I mean, he wasn't an actual medic though. So he, he was there to help, um, people who were injured, but he wasn't, he wasn't an actual trained medic. He had lifeguard, uh, certification. So I'm just as much a medic as, as he is. Uh, having been a surf instructor, secondarily, I use the word playing playing cop for a reason, and it's because what I picked up on the moment that I was walking through the streets with him is that he was playing the role of both cop, medic, later on when he had the fire extinguisher, also fireman, but it was like he was playing a role. It wasn't like he was actually, you know, really knew what he was doing in that situation. And so my uh, piece is 
the intention is to show my personal perspective and going from witness to human being. And so, you know, I didn't, I didn't intend this as a hit piece to Kyle in any way, shape or form. And, and in fact, it's, uh, it's, I believe more excoriating of the media than anybody else, but that's what everybody focused on. And I wish the best for Kyle. I know that he uh, suffered a lot of trauma as a result of what happened. And I didn't mean to add on to that, but with that being said, I did have to take the opportunity to state my human perspective of the events that night, because I believe that, you know, down the road, it's, it's an important perspective. And I was right there. And, and what people got from me prior to that piece was uh, me trying my best to play the role of witness. So if people mm-hmm. don't like, you know, what my opinion is, that's fine. This is America. I mean, I, I, I really appreciate the fact that we're even able to have like the fact that we're on this show right now. And we're talking about this at such great length and that we actually even got a response from Kyle and I'm now interacting with that. That's exactly what I want to come out of uh, all of what happened in 2020, which is people a reckoning on the media where people realize that the corporate institutions that drive our discourse are driving us apart. And you know what? If like if Kyle wants to have a beer or sit down on a podcast and talk about it, I'm willing to talk to anybody. You know, I'm not saying like, he's welcome to do that right here. He's never been on the show, though. We invited him. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I have no problem with that because he is a human being and he was affected just like I was. And so me providing my perspective, that word victim, it, it, it was not used in a legal sense. I was not stating that he was criminally liable for anything. They're dead and he's not. And there was a series of decisions that went into that. I know, but, but like, and I'll, I'll just challenge you on that. But the, the reason mm-hmm. they're dead and he's not is there, is there, be, that's what I was going at earlier. Nobody yes. made Rosenbaum show up at that thing, at that, at that protest. Nobody made him run after Kyle. Nobody made him lunge for a gun he could clearly see was there and dangerous. You know, I see this and I say, it's unfortunate he made those decisions, but that's on him. That is on him. Mm-hmm. So that's what people are reacting. And then you find out his background and you really, like most of us, n- not those who held him while he was dying, think, I'm done. I'm, I'm kind of yeah. out of sympathy for Joseph Rosenbaum. Yes, absolutely. Look, that's totally fine. And I absolutely understand that opinion. And I understand why people have that opinion. But like I said, the I can't unpack the lived experience of that and i didn't know Mm -hmm. those details at the time and uh what about what about this though richie what about this because they said um people are are hating you because when you went back to kenosha you said i tried to retrace my steps there was no memorial for rosenbaum or hoover Mm -hmm. huber's the other the other guy was killed and you know people are like what what is he saying those those were bad guys who attacked Mm -hmm. a 17 year old well what i was the point of uh providing that detail was actually to mirror uh, the lionization that happened with Rosenbaum initially. And then how after the case, you know, they forgot about him. And so like, there's still Mm -hmm. a, if you go to where George Floyd died, there's a massive memorial that's still there. Right. And I'm not saying there wasn't a judgment on their behavior. It was a judgment on the way in which the city is moving forward. And so the fact that there was no memorial for them, I also said in the next sentence that there's, there was no plaque for the riots and the violence. Like, so, so you're, are you saying nothing... that they were fake news when they tried to act like they were all concerned about Hoover and Rosenbaum, that that was exactly, BS? They exactly. Were... And yeah. so it's funny because that detail was actually what I was trying to get at is the fact that the left used him opportunistically, yes. used Rosenbaum and Hoover opportunistically as heroes and then kind of just cast into the wayside. And this, the city itself wants to forget about what happened. And so that was the, the inclusion of that detail yeah, I'm well aware of of the way that people responded to it, but um, <laughs> that was what I experienced and what I saw and what I thought about when I was there. So, I, wrote it. I mean, on the flip side, we and we've talked about it at length on the show, though not with you, <laughs> the demonization of Kyle Rittenhouse by the media. Yes, yes. I mean, absolutely, it, it dwarfs and, anything that we've talked yeah. about. It's been absolutely mm-hmm. disgusting from the beginning, yeah. as we now know, this kid. He was not a vigilante. He was not a white supremacist. There was absolutely mm-hmm. no evidence to that effect, but he was called that by people like Joe Biden. I mean, it's crazy mm-hmm. that Joe Biden actually called Kyle a white supremacist. Uh, and so the kid has been through a lot. He was on Tucker recently because we are at the two year mark um, since it all happened and described his life these days as follows. Well, we're going to make the media pay for what they did to me. They made it hard for me to live a normal life. I can't go yeah. out into public. I can't go to the store. It's hard for me to go anywhere without security. Shoot, doing basic things like taking my dog to the dog park is difficult. So they made it really difficult to be normal. And 
they affected future job opportunities to me. I don't think I'll ever be able to work or get a job because I'm afraid an employer may not hire me. So as somebody who was kind of living it with Kyle in a, in a way, in, on, a, on a parallel track at least, a witness, somebody was there that night and so on. How do you see what the media and these Democrats, I mean, it's not, it's, you have to say, it was people like Kamala Harris, it was people like Joe Biden, mm -hmm. it was people like H Hakeem Jeffries, head of the, de the Democratic Congressional Congress. Those are the ones who demonized him publicly and have not apologized, not yes. even a little. How do you see their role? Yeah. So basically that piece is, was one slice of, you know, basically how each side tried to lionize mm -hmm. and demonize um, them. But I'm going to get into that much deeper and there would be much more to come regarding that story of how I, I remember I, the next morning I didn't even sleep. I wasn't the cops, uh, the police station until like 4.30 a.m. Got home. There was a Vice News article that stated that he opened fire. And that was when I decided, OK, I got to go on the news as fast as possible because it's crazy that people in the media are taking what happened and claiming that he opened fire because, you know, open fire on protesters, they said. So basically, like. From the moment that I saw that article, I knew that there was going to be a huge narrative that was being spun up. And then the fact that he was being called a white supremacist, obviously, that just takes it a step even further. Um, I did state in the piece that, you know, one side called him a hero, the other side called him a white supremacist, and neither of those were true. So I, you know, basically b both of those I will say though, but, but I will say it was not, it wasn't even at all. It was like a complete me media pile on in the guy. Yes. And then there were some more right leaning journalists who called him a hero. But I think a lot of people on the right were just open minded to his self defense claims. It was like they're not equivalent. Would would you agree? I mean, the, I would agree. The amount yes. of in incoming he took from the media was breathtaking. One hundred percent. But I also don't think that that warrants you know the right uh, taking a reactionary approach, which is like, well, if they say he's the worst, then we're gonna you know. Mm. Uh, prop them up and not By the talk way, honestly about the just just pulled a couple of of you know examples um this is we, we saw some stuff like this but um naacp president commented after the verdict this verdict reminds us of the treacherous role that white supremacy and privilege play within our just what what then there was reverend al sharpton never misses a moment to exploit these continue to be dark days for black people killed at the hands of people that believe our lives do not matter. There were no black people there that night mm -hmm. and w involved in the shootings, right? Nobody, no black person was shot that night and no black person was doing the shooting that night in Kenosha. Um, but still, like the race baiters like Sharpton, mm -hmm. again, never miss an opportunity. All right, let me turn the page because I know we only have a minute left. The New York Times <laughs> decided, I mean, this is like a, a theme in your life, getting smeared. <laughs> um, Totally unfairly after January 6th, they, where you were covering that too in your role as a journalist, they put you in the New York Times uh, in an article called The American Abyss, a picture of you, a, hist a historian of fascism and political atrocity on Trump, the mob, and what comes next. Next, You're right there without your shirt. <laughs> they <call> <laughs> I'm <laughs> they looking for my phone. I lost my phone. All right, I'm just saying your shirt's anything. off again. Okay, for our listening audience, <laughs> naked as a jaybird from the from eyes. the belt up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they, this is the caption: a rioter, a rioter. That's you during the yeah. mayhem at the Capitol. Period. He punched the door after being pepper sprayed and forced out of the building. Three forty-five p.m. Virtually every word in that is untrue. Like, yeah. Also, it's hilarious that they claim that like I punched that door and somehow yeah. that was me who broke it because when I got knocked down, it was actually right as they were closing the final doors. I was trying to capture that last moment of the last group being forced out and I got um, knocked into the door. My head hit the door and I'm a hockey player. Like I'm, I'm holding on to that phone no matter what. And I've been in situations yeah. where I've been knocked down and clutching it. I got my bell rung concussion and dropped my phone. And so I landed on actually a pry bar. Not a crowbar, but like a bar that's like this long, which oh. is used to pry open, you know, very heavy things. And I landed on that. I'm bleeding. I get up and I'm tapping on the window phone. You know, where's my phone to the cops? It looks like I'm saying fuck in the photo. I'm saying phone and I'm tapping with my finger. And so the, the they take that photo and then me tapping my finger and saying phone turns into he punched, he broke that door. You know, that's the implication. Oh He's a rioter. He Did looks they like a ever knuckle call you? the call you. Did the Times oh, before running this oh, call you at I, all? Oh, so I, t I, they did not call me prior. No, absolutely. Absolutely <sighs> not. 
They they Disgusting. didn't call me. I don't even think they knew that they'd relied on me for a lot of the stuff in Kenosha. I talked with their forensics reporter like in multiple nights, multiple hours to so make sure that he got a lot of the details right. Um, so no, they didn't run anything by me. And then they they actually uh, issued. I had, had to get them to issue multiple corrections after the fact. Yeah, the first correction um, says, "Okay, we were wrong in the earlier version of the essay. It misidentified the shirtless man. Um, he was a videographer working for the Daily Caller, a right wing website, not yeah. one of the Trump supporters. Who's not uh-huh. good enough? New York Times. They had said <laughs> you were a rioter that like, you would punch yeah, you the, said door. I punched the door. What are you talking right. about? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to be a little bit more forthcoming, yeah. or I'm going to sue your ass. That's really what was going on. So then finally they come out with another correction saying, uh, wrong again. <laughs> they got out, they got rid of the right wing thing because somebody there mm-hmm. wised up and said, let's not be douchebags. Well, about I, this. I, I hired my own lawyer and there's a, there's a long story there on how that all happened. But even that, that had that, to be forced out. I, I paid for it literally. Oh, God. Um, They're and so I mean, I had a great you. lawyer, but basically you know i talked to 50 lawyers before i talked before i settled on him and they're all saying oh we're gonna go to the supreme court and we're gonna just keep going until they pay up and uh, this lawyer uh who i won't name because i haven't gotten his permission but he was like yeah i bet you everybody's telling you we're gonna take the supreme court he goes guess what they're getting paid and you're paying them that whole time Mm. he's like i'll pursue corrective action give me your wish list and pay me x amount you know, it was, I sold some Dogecoin. So it was, uh, it was good that I sold that at the time anyways. Um, <laughs> and so I'm not, I'm not, um, I, like, it's such a long story in terms of how the first correction happened and how, you know, I kind of argued for the second correction and it still wasn't good enough. And then I had to go and hire a lawyer. And, um, but that whole story, I think it's a great way to unpack, you know, how these tragedies happen and then get completely manipulated. Like, you know, people were saying that, um, Kyle opened fire or people were like used me as that same, kind of caricature of evil shirtless you know i i'm not gonna lie my hair's long you know i, I look kind of like a knuckle dragon neanderthal okay well, I'll you take have it. a weird face um, on but but your muscles look good <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know you're know, you right this is all part of the same long story about a media that's agenda driven and not fact driven mm-hmm. unlike you i'd like to believe myself as well um and so that leads me to my last point which is what next you're you left the daily caller why and what next? Well, I left because I've been number one trying to unpack everything that happened in 2020 and 2021, uh, writing all that down. And it's, I've been doing it all in my off time on the weekends. And now that I have, you know, basically a manuscript together, I have to edit it. It's an incredible amount of work. So that's one. And, but number two, uh, the typecasting that we were talking about through, you know, both, both sides, uh, one side typecasting me as trepanering to the left uh, when my opinion is is not in their favor. And then uh, one side, you know, calling me a right wing rioter, et cetera. Um, I just wanted to step outside of that and just kind of be free to say whatever I want, regardless of mm. uh, workplace typecast. And my first story that I'm working on, um, I've known this, bu- uh, well, he likes being called a bum. So I'm using the term bum. I actually talked to him about that. Um, he claims that they're the, the wisest people in DC because they see everybody. Um, but he, I've been, I've known this guy for eight years. You know, I give him a couple cigarettes or a couple bucks or, you know, a nugget of weed, what, whatever to help him over the last eight years. And I've just been sitting down talking to him, um, you know, under the bridge and we're just hanging out eating steak. And so I think that the message there is like, I'm sick and tired of the media saying, oh, you can't talk to this person or you can't put a human face on that person. I, I will, you know, talk to whoever and get, elicit their truth and then let the audience decide. And so while you know I put my uh, opinion in that Newsweek piece, I do I do want to approach it, uh, these kinds of stories that are getting polarized by the media really with that same strategy that we did in 2020, which is just be a fly on the wall and elicit their their truth. But now that I'm I'm doing it on my own, really the, the you know the coverage, what what stories I decide to focus on, that's that's up to me, which is my favorite part about it. That's great. And uh, what Substack? I would assume Substack. that'll be one out. Richard McGinnis. Okay. Substack. dot com. Okay, good. And also the Megyn Kelly show. (laughs) Well, you're welcome to come on here anytime. I trust your journalism. I I can say that firsthand. I've seen it for many years now. And uh, I'm totally rooting for you, Richie. All the best to you. I appreciate you having me, Megan. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, We'll see you again soon, I hope. All right. Coming up, you will not believe this, but there is breaking news about Meghan Markle. Uh, We'll tell you who's coming forward to challenge her latest round of BS in that magazine article that's getting all that buzz. You're not going to want to miss this. It's next. 
Meghan Markle. You will not believe what just broke about her. Just by way of background, before we get to it, she's back with a new episode of her podcast. This one, she's joined by Mariah Carey to discuss the duality of diva. Who the, Who's listening to this drivel? Just a day after an interview came out between Meghan Markle and The Cut, which is an offshoot of New York Magazine, I now know, where Markle compared herself to Nelson Mandela. All right, now hold on to that thought for one second. My guest here is Maureen Callahan, critic at large for The New York Post. If you don't read Maureen Callahan, oh, you are missing out. She is so great with a pen. Her piece was on the cover of The Post yesterday, and she gives a hilarious and unforgiving and totally honest take on what she calls toddler and tiara tantrums that Meghan Markle continues to throw over her alleged mistreatment by the royal family. Maureen, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Megan. Thanks for that intro. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. I read everything you write. And, oh, uh, thanks. Oh, my God. We all circulate. We're like, Maureen, she's back. <laughs> if you haven't seen the one she did on Alec Baldwin a couple of weeks ago, you're missing out. Um, okay. So she said, so Meghan Markle said that she saw the live production of The Lion King in London. This is what she says to The Cut magazine. And that when she saw it, someone came out from the cast who was from South Africa and told her that that basically she, when she married Prince Harry, it was as big uh, in South Africa as when Nelson Mandela was freed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, she, so already it says a lot about Megan. Like, okay, so I'm thinking, all right, the fact that she would choose that anecdote to relay to New York Magazine essentially the cut uh, as indicative of her press and how people feel about her is totally it, it, t- tone deaf and in the, her head is in the clouds because people have said crazy nice things to me and they've said crazy mean things to me and I would never repeat them to a reporter as indicative of what my press is or how people really feel about me right so the fact that she plucked that one to say this this is what I mean to the people tells you a lot about Meghan Markle but now we find out it appears to have been a lie. <laughs> Maureen. You don't, you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> Maureen, the Daily Mail, and God bless the Daily Mail for going and doing this. They went and found all of the actors who were in that live version of The Lion King. And they, they found the one guy who was from South Africa, as Megan claims the person who said this to her was in the cast and from South Africa. Okay, and I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> An acclaimed actor and friend of Nelson, Mande- of Nelson Mandela today told Daily Mail he's baffled by her suggestions that the country had rejoiced when she married Prince Harry and revealed he's never met her, despite claiming to be the only South African member of the cast in Disney's remake of The Lion King. All right, so the, his name is Dr. He's gone on the record. His name is Dr. John Connie, K-A-N-I. He believes the Duchess of Sussex has made a, quote, faux pas after she used a U.S. magazine interview to imply that her royal wedding sparked celebrations in South Africa, reminiscent of the release of his friend um, Nelson Mandela, the legendary anti-apartheid leader. He said Mr. Mandela's walk to freedom after 27 years was a landmark moment, while her marriage to Prince Harry was no big deal in South Africa, adding that the two events, quote, cannot be spoken of in the same breath, and you can't really even say where you were when Meghan married Harry. She, of course, had gone on, blah, blah, blah. Oh, here's her quote. I just need you to know, he allegedly looked at me and said, I just need you to know when you married into this family, we rejoiced in the streets the same as we did when Mandela was freed from prison. But Dr. Connie, a veteran of the Royal Shakespeare Company who voiced the the mandrel shaman Rafiki, told DailyMail.com he was the only South African in the the production. He's never met Megan. He was not at the UK premiere. And he said the only other South African who was involved was Lebo M, a composer who was responsible for the music, but he was not in the cast. Anyway, Maureen, it appears to be completely made up. Oh, you know, I feel as though everyone aside from Meghan Markle has realized that Meghan Markle is now firmly in camp territory, you know, to yeah. to to compare yourself uh, you know, a minor royal who worked for, I think, 18 months, maybe, uh, to Nelson Mandela. I mean, I said in the column, it's clear she has no friends left. It's clear that there is no publicist or crisis manager of repute who would work with her. You know, uh, I, I just it it 
it made me laugh out loud, but also it was jaw dropping and offensive and narcissistic isn't a big enough word. Um, but I, you know, she just, she keeps giving us like, this is the content she's providing. <laughs> she doesn't yeah. realize it's, it's comic relief. Right. Uh, We're not admiring her. She no. doesn't understand. And then, and then when we don't admire her, she gets confused. Like I've, I'm being misrepresented again, as opposed to the reality of, no, you're perfectly well represented. We see exactly who you are and are reacting accordingly. Well, the, the you know, you mentioned at the, at the top of the segment, um, her second podcast episode. I, yeah. I listened to the first. It was really, it was really tough going. I mean, I earned my <laughs> paycheck that week, but, uh, you know, Mariah Carey saying to her, you, you've given us some diva moments. And, you know, Megan has this sort of on air meltdown in which she sort of talks herself out of believing that somehow shade into Mariah actually paying her the highest of compliments. Yes. You know, it's, it's a really fascinating window into that psyche where uh, criticism of any kind, it just c cannot be tolerated. Yes. That's exactly right. And she has a pattern of that, right? A suing. I mean, we all get bad press. Anybody who's in the public eye is going to get na negative, nasty press. For me, I move past it. I'm quick to forgive. It's our business. You can't be a public figure and not be able to take some barbs and arrows and just move, move on. You know, like, my God, be a grown up. But the more she talks, the more I'm like, oh, now I get it. Like Mariah Carey, who Megan is calling a diva turns to her and says, you've had diva moments too. And she's so wounded mm -hmm. that she later says she began sweating and realized her girl crush might be over and was only able to move past it once Mariah clarified that she meant it as a compliment and was speaking about Megan's looks. I threw up a little in my mouth, Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is kind of what we're in for. I think her Spotify, uh, her presence on Spotify will will not be a long one. Um, I, I just the other thing that that you know perplexes me, and we saw it with the Oprah interview, and and at the t and I'm not saying this in sort of any self congratulatory way, but at the time I felt like I was the only person watching it who thought she was completely full of it. You know, it was such a terrible performance and Prince Harry looked so uncomfortable, especially when she brought up the thing about the quote unquote racist royal, you know, and you saw Oprah's eyes just light up, you know, and then they pretended Hater. to be offended beyond all measure. But, you know, you see Oprah going, oh, my God, this is the most amazing piece of gossip I've heard in forever. Um, but she lies. She's a liar. She's a liar. Yes. Yep. And. I see very few in the media willing to call her out on that. Yeah. No, and I think it's right. an interesting bellwether in terms of where we are as a society. You know, there's there's something a little bit deeper going on. And, and you know, I think that with her, you know, she 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 brought up race again in the interview without ever bringing it up, you know, without ever using the words. But, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of charge stuff and, you know. She's what she's really doing is trivializing it. And what she's really doing is, is, you know, sort of digging her own grave because there will come a point when nobody will believe my other favorite tall tale from her podcast last week was in sum and substance that baby Archie almost burned to death while they were on tour in South Africa and the Royals <laughs> did not care. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He was caught in a towering inferno right. and no one gave a shit. Yeah. The space heater, the errant space heater that almost went up, you know, I mean, dear in a Lord. room in which the baby was not present. No, no the baby wasn't there. Conveniently left out. The baby was not there. The baby was never in danger. But, you know, it, to Megan, in, in her description of it, this was just just the the most monstrous thing for uh, the royals to expect her to carry on with her duties as though nothing had happened because, in essence, nothing had happened. <laughs> right. So so you, she does lie. And, and you're exactly right. And I wanted to make a point on the race thing. So she says to Oprah, there's a ro raging racist, basically, in the royal mm -hmm. family who is concerned about how dark my children are going to be. And she doesn't have the presence of mind while Prince Philip at the time was on his deathbed right. to at least exclude the old people. It's not right. the queen and it's not Prince Philip who's almost dead. Right. right. No, she won't do that. Harry didn't do that either. They just kept their mouths silent and, and indicted everybody in doing that. Mm -hmm. And Oprah, no follow up. 
what like right like she i would have been all over them what like white on rice you know what i mean like who exactly you have to tell me you can't make an allegation like that and not she gave one pushback and that was it who when where why what was the follow-up what did you do same problem for this reporter from the cut right where megan goes on about um she says that the press has been calling her children the Mm n-word totally unsubstantial who which press which reporter, which publish, uh, which publication did that? When was it? What did you do? Was it ever retracted? How did they say it? Did they actually use it? Because that word could never appear in a paper in today's day. Like, no follow-up. She just throws it out there because she knows that they'll dine on it. They'll love it. And then on the flip side, she's apparently doing the same thing in a positive way. She's using race in a positive way and comparing herself to Nelson Mandela, which is also a lie. It's also, it's, I think that's, it's terrible. Don't... Nelson Mandela. I mean, that's sacrilege. I, you know, <laughs> but I do think the um, what you were saying about Oprah. I do think Oprah realizes the the, the dent that that interview did to her her legacy, her brand. She's mm-hmm. kept her distance since. It was remarkably sycophantic for someone like Oprah. I mean, she, mm-hmm. you know, that that was incredible. The other thing that I'm so glad you brought up that uh, the assertion that uh, Megan made that her baby has been called the N word. Okay, a baby. Now, someone as wildly litigious as Ms. Meghan Markle, you don't think she would have slapped whoever, whatever outlet that was, whatever journalist that was with a lawsuit post haste? Please, do you think that if that had been printed anywhere, aired anywhere, that that wouldn't be a huge story that even people who are not fans of Meghan Markle would find that offensive and wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, she she she's not nearly as smart as she believes herself to be because she makes up these lies that are so easily uh, debunked, debunked, fact checked quickly. Um, And and I, I. I wonder, you know, I think, you know, the more she talks, I think the more the the more toxic a, a presence she becomes. I don't think, you know, she's sort of gone from when she first married in, she was editing British Vogue and she before she was even married to Harry, she was on the cover of Vanity Fair, which if anybody needs a good end of summer read Tom Bauer's book on the Royals, Mm. uh, he's got this great vignette in there in which, you know, the Royals said to her, "You, you, you cannot you can do this cover, but you cannot talk about anything regarding your relationship with Harry or your, you know, sort of they were fast tracking her in. Um, which is also something she she never ever talks about. Um, all the sort of special dispensations she was given because she was she was seen as a as a win. You know, she was seen as an asset, um, and and they wanted Harry to be happy. But um, you know, she's gone from from Vanity Fair, which in in Bauer's book he he talks about how she lied to Harry and told him they were putting her on the cover because of her of her basic cable show that like ten people <laughs> watch. You know, and so so now he must. No, this is, I mean, you have to wonder what it's like in that house, you know, when lie upon lie oh. sort of reveals well, itself. Sounds like a nightmare. I mean, the, the, just the anecdotes in that piece by the cut where he, she, yeah, I know you wrote about this, I think, but where they saw the two palm trees oh, God. in the backyard of their Montecito <laughs> mansion and they knew they had to buy it because they were entwined at the bottom. And she tells the reporter, my husband, she only calls him my husband. My husband looked at me and said, my love. They're us. <laughs> oh, there's so many gems in this piece. Uh, one of my other favorites, which I didn't didn't make it into the column, was you know she has Harry up the road, at the you know the multimillionaire's house up the road, fixing her sprinklers. Oh right, yeah. right. Like like sure. I don't I don't think this guy has ever even used an ATM until he moved <laughs> to America. I mean it. Like I don't think there are many things he can do for himself. You yes, know, there's this I know. There's this moment they only in talk the about piece. it. She's, they only talk about how he's he's joined a polo team. It's like oh. Oh, anything else. <laughs> Great. Great. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 there's this moment where, you know, she was gone the day before doing this photo shoot, which she couldn't do in her own mansion. She had to borrow mm-hmm. a mansion for it. God knows mm-hmm. why. And he says to her, you were gone for 10 hours yesterday. You know, like he was clearly just rattling around hapless and helpless. And uh, and my other favorite was the school run. Um, Another lie. And uh, which, which this great detail she's gotten there where these two mothers waiting for their kids do a double take. And it doesn't seem that it's because they can't believe 
the Meghan Markle is in their presence, it's because they probably never see her. <laughs> Pick up. It's probably the nanny. <laughs> and then, of course, I there's going the, a different way. I guess the she homeless lied guy, about, right? Oh, right. The homeless guy. Who I love how you talk about how, yes, what are we teaching little Archie? Because they stopped and, and gave some homeless guy a backpack with like some supplies in it. Go ahead. Like a puny, like, you know, granola bar, because, you know, you can only eat healthy and organic, even if you're homeless. Like, don't give them a full meal. Don't give them a gift card or some cash or, you know, anything usable. But, you know, a ba- like a backpack. She has her security guy. Dear, uh, it's yeah. it's so good. It's so like good. A, let, let Pay attention, Archie. When one is a child or when one grows up and one wants to help somebody who's suffering, send your security. You yes. just send your staff right out there. <laughs> and then you come home to your Tyler Perry gifted grand piano. I, like the name dropping of the celebrities who I knew before I met my husband. You say in your piece, oh, so relatable, right? Like she doesn't get why we can't stand her. Oh, my goodness. She did it with Serena Williams, too. The The bulk of the podcast was it, making sure that we all understood that she befriended Serena before she ever knew Harry. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, she, she, the, the the it's such a it's such a she doesn't sort of realize how much her slip is showing. Right. The level of insecurity. The I was I just read this amazing quote by Marlon Brando. He called he once called Bob Hope a barrel without a bottom. And I think <laughs> Meghan Markle is our barrel without a bottom. It is a yeah. bottomless pit of need that no amount of podcasts or Netflix deals or magazine covers will ever fill. That's the thing. She's not interesting and she's not special and she's never accomplished anything of note in her life beyond becoming backup girl number 40 for Howie Mandel. The only thing that makes her interesting is the fact that she married Prince Harry and It's the thing that she is most embittered about, Mm. angry about. She spends all of her time now criticizing the royal family, which is the only reason anyone gives a damn about her. Right. And I think she's run out of material, quite frankly. You know, know, she's always alluding to, well, there's things I might say, you know, the, the, the way the piece ends, she says, like, you know, I'm quiet until I'm not. You know, yeah. I've been she, she, after didn't it came sign out. Anything. She, yeah, she alluded she's been keeping a journal. I mean, I think that the royals had her number pretty early on. I think they probably limited her access to anything of real. You know, the the only thing she's got is 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 whatever um, relational difficulties exist between the brothers. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I also thought it was pretty great when um, the the palace sort of refuted that claim that she made in the Oprah interview about um, Kate making her cry, you know, and, yeah. and she did this the thing that she always does, and she's never as delicate about it as she thinks she is. She's, you know, I couldn't possibly talk badly about my sister-in-law, but just let me talk about her, like, let me <laughs> criticize her just for a minute, and then I'm going to pull back. You know, when, and the real story, and I think this also came from Bauer's book, is that she was bullying Charlotte, who is at the time was three Kate and William's Mm -hmm. daughter who was going to be a bridesmaid. She was bullying her because she wasn't up to snuff, I suppose. And Kate cried and then went over with a peace offering. She went over to uh, the apartment that Megan shared with Harry and brought flowers. And Megan took the flowers, threw them in the trash and slammed the door in Kate Middleton's face. I mean, that is a version of events I find much more credible. Me too, because she she thinks if we just know her again, like we're going to like her. Okay, show me the friends who know you, who mm-hmm. have stuck by you. Who's still in your life? Mm-hmm. There's not even a family member. They're mm-hmm. all gone. Everyone who knew you either fled from you or they were dumped by you because they weren't famous. They weren't Tyler, Paper, uh, Tyler Perry. They weren't mm-hmm. Oprah, Gail, all these people who she didn't know at all who she had at her wedding. George Clooney, I'm mm-hmm. sure they were really tight, right? Like the people who did know her jumped ship. And on the subject of the lies, I thought the one you were going to mention earlier, um, that she claimed she can't have this life in London of dropping her children off at school, which she conveniently brought the cut reporter to, (laughs) because, quote, I would have 40 photographers taking photos in a press pen if I wanted to drop Archie at school in the UK. Meanwhile, my friend Dan Wooten, uh, who has broken tons of news on them, says William and Kate drop off and pick up their three kids, including the future king of England. Right. Virtually every single 
day and there's not one photographer there. There's certainly no press pen. And uh, another news outlet in the UK reports that it's literally just the first day of school where two photogs are allowed to take a picture. The royals know it's going to happen. And then they distribute those photos. If anybody else else ever shows up to take a photo of the kids, no, there isn't a single UK uh, paper that will print it. But she wants us to believe she's like a beetle who can't. Right. Like, <laughs> right. right. Like, and, 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 um, to your, to the beat the Beatles. It's it it yeah. her whole bit about I I didn't know who Prince Harry was. I I never oh. heard of the Queen Mother. You know, it's like in this day and age, you know, it's like it it's so reminiscent of Yoko Ono. That was her whole thing. You know, I never heard of John Lennon. Who are the Beatles? <laughs> yes, and she also broke up the band. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I mean, you know, that's and and you're completely right about Megan not understanding why. She's not liked, why, let alone beloved, you know, and yeah. the, I don't think it's any accident that her podcast drops and then the cut cover story is published two days before today, the 25th anniversary of Princess Diana's death. That's exactly right. She wanted to be in the news. Mm -hmm. She wanted to step on Princess Diana's anniversary. She wants us to think she is Princess Diana, which is never going to happen. Mm -hmm. Instead of, as you write in your piece, what she really is, a Kardashian. And by the way, you undersold your comment earlier, which I read out loud to my husband. I, I thought it was so <laughs> funny. This is Maureen. Again, the name is Toddler and Tiara. Meghan Markle still throwing tantrums about royal family. She write, you write, uh, her self-regard runs in direct opposition to her waning relevance. She clearly has no real friends left or even decent publicists because anyone with an iota of common sense would say, you know, Megan, it's probably best not to compare yourself to Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. She has no friends. She has no people. And there's a reason for that. Yes. And but, you know, the the upside is we get gems like that you know yes. there was dancing in the streets of south africa when i married in and i'm most reminiscent of nelson mandela who else who else yeah. she's got to be become a better liar like keep it vaguer don't say it was the one south african cast member because the daily mail is 100 percent gonna go <laughs> find that guy <laughs> i know liars always that always trips them up the addition of unnecessary details yeah, you're so right Maureen, what a pleasure. Please come back. Oh, my God. So much fun. Thanks for having me, Megan. All right. Till the next time. Bye. Thanks to all of you for listening. Go ahead and subscribe to the show at YouTube.com slash Megan Kelly. If you like the mean girl conversation, <laughs> sorry, but some people deserve a little nastiness because they're nasty. Um, we'll be bringing you Michael Knowles tomorrow. Don't miss that. And we'll talk to you then. <laughs>